Hi, so in this video, it's not really about World of Warcraft. It's more about me in World of Warcraft. And I'm going to get quite philosophical in it. And I'm going to go off on what appears to be tangents, but it's sort of planned out in theory. I have notes, uh, which I'll be trying to refer to, mostly so I don't miss anything out. But at the same time, I'm, I don't know how long it's going to take uh, to go through it all. But when I looked at the notes emerging, I thought, well, blimey, if I only just read those, it's still going to be a really long video. So I'm going to split it up into parts. And it all stems really from something I did on Patreon. I, I, I do regular videos, just blogs, really, or vlogs, really, on Patreon. Uh, and I was talking about the fact that for the first time ever in World of Warcraft, since I've been playing it, apart from the time I quit, when, of course, it was a completely different thing, I'm looking at the end of my involvement in World of Warcraft not being when World of Warcraft stops. Now, that's not to say that I'm thinking of quitting WoW. I'm not. It's just a realisation that I might at some point. <laughs> you know, I'm not looking for quitting WoW now. It's just like anything, um, you know, when you want to do something. For me, I've, I keep saying with World of Warcraft, what is the real thing for me in World of Warcraft? And it's the hard mode rating. That's it. That's not to say I wouldn't play World of Warcraft if I stopped that or if I had never picked it up. It's just that it would be a very casual game. There are other games I play casually. It would be just the same as that. Maybe there'll be some weeks I won't play it at all. So, it's, and with Mythic Raiding, you know, there are certain benefits to it. I get something out of it. Of course, that's the motivation for doing it. But there are also drawbacks. Uh, and I'm going to discuss that more in an episode later on in the series. But, you know, that's fairly obvious, isn't it? Motivation for anything is always based on what do you get out of it and what are the drawbacks. And if what you get out of it, the benefits, should we call it, are greater than the drawbacks when you stack them up against each other, then you are motivated to do it. The larger the gap, the more the motivation you have. And it's very personal as well. So if I did stop, for example, it's simply because the drawbacks will have overtaken or at least equaled uh, the benefits, and I wouldn't be going, oh, you know, Blizzard have ruined the game or anything like that. I know some people do that and they quit. I wouldn't say that at all, because I'm very, very well aware that it's all personal. Your motivation is personal. What I get out of Mythic Raiding is personal to me, because it's different to what other people get out of Mythic Raiding. What the drawbacks are is personal to me, because what I consider a drawback, someone else may not. Or even if we both agree that it's a drawback, my estimation of how much of a drawback might be greater or less or equal to someone else's. So it's all very personal to me. So what I'm aiming to do, don't think of this as anything other than me basically rambling about myself, and I'm going to be telling almost life story. There will be moments in my life that are sort of led up to, it's really trying to analyse why I get what I get out of Mythic Raiding, but also why it may not be enough. Um, and that's what I want to sort of explore here. It's basically what makes me tick, what led to making me tick in that particular way uh, and trying to extrapolate from that and trying to see, well, what is it that would make me pause? Because as I say, that gap between what I get out of it uh, and what I don't, the, the benefits and the drawbacks, is actually now quite small. Now, that's not to say, don't imagine it as, you know, a gap that's been narrowing over time and it's inevitably going to close completely. That's not it at all. Uh, some, you know, it's, it goes back and forth, it ebbs and flows. I mean, there was a time in WoW's history when I did quit, so the drawbacks overtook the benefits. In that particular case, it's because the benefits all but disappeared. It wasn't that the drawbacks were bad, the benefits all but disappeared. This time round, I would say that it's more that the drawbacks have grown. And the benefits have maybe shrunk back a little bit, but it's not really the benefits that have changed. So again, it's all that relative thing. And when I was thinking of this, and I inevitably had to think across my time playing World of Warcraft, which now stands at, what, about 13 years? Um, and, and, you know, I, I've, as we all have of, of grown up over that time, I, I was in my 20s, only just, but in my 20s when I started playing WoW. I'm now in my 40s. And I think over time, your perception of the future changes. I've noticed a few changes. Now, it may just be me. But I'm not one of these people that thinks that we're all unique. And I, I, I'm one of these people that thinks that fundamentally we all basically function in very similar ways. Um, so I doubt this is just me. And just one little ex example in terms of how we can perceive the future and our place in it. So when I was young, if I saw a new story about uh, coping with dementia in the family or cancer or something like that, you know, you would have a lot of sympathy for the people you're watching this documentary or news story, something like that. 
And, and these days you do as well, but then you also imagine yourself in the same situation. So I imagine myself, when I'm watching these stories, as I was a couple of weeks ago, about uh, families dealing with dementia, uh, with loved ones, and I'm thinking to myself, what if that happened to me? Imagine if I still do YouTube, and I come on and I do a video, and it's basically, it's a new video, but it's basically on a topic I did a couple of days ago, and everyone's going, you talked about this a couple of days ago, what's going on here? Um, or, or I was in the middle of a stream, and I'm talking, and then suddenly I don't know where I am. You know, how distressing would that be for everyone concerned? Uh, so you imagine yourself in that situation. But that's not really the perception of the future I'm talking about here. It's more in terms of your place with it and your plans for the future, whether it's a year's time, two years time, five years time, 10 years time, whatever. Because as you get older, you're forced to change your attitude. When you're young, I think you see the future in terms of your own plans for the future. And entirely in terms of that. Again, that was definitely the case with me. It was right, I plan to do this, I plan to do that. But sometimes those plans change and that's fine. Sometimes they're forced to change, that's less fine. But sometimes they just change because you change. Um, now, to give you an example, let's look at gaming because, you know, I'm into gaming. I've been into gaming for quite a long time. Now, I wouldn't say I was there for the birth of home computing, almost. I think you had to be just a few years older than me. So I was born in 1976, around about the time of home computing. Now, <clears throat> of course, I wasn't playing a computer game when I was born. Uh, my dad bought the family's first home computer when I was about four-ish, I want to say, four or five. It's about 1980, 1981. I think it was 1980. And, and I remember the very first game I'm, but the, the, just before i come on to that so the computer itself you know games were loaded on with a cassette a tape cassette and it could take five to ten minutes to load up a game at the end of it it may not work you might have to try it again or adjust the heads on the tape recorder uh, that sort of thing um didn't have a monitor i mean some people probably had monitors i didn't have we didn't have a custom made monitor uh, so we used our old small black and white television. Uh, we've just got a new color television as well. So, and that was that. Um, and in the end, after a couple of years, because it was downstairs in the lounge and that's where the family computer was. After a couple of years, everyone really worked out that I was the only one using it. So it basically bugged into my room. And that was, that was great. Um, but, so yeah, cassettes for the first time, which meant saving anything was a arduous process. So you didn't play a lot of games where you need to save your position, for example, because that'd be quite tricky. Didn't always work very well. Um, and then we had floppy disks, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, which were floppy. It made sense, floppy disks, because they're floppy. Then there were three and a half inch floppy disks. That made less sense because they weren't actually floppy. They were quite rigid. You know, if you tried bending them, then they would break. Uh, so a bit of a misnomer there. Then we had CD-ROMs, now we have digital downloads. So the whole way in which we get our games these days is is very, very different. Hugely different. Even, you know, going 80s and 90s, I mean, sometimes when you wanted to try out a game in advance of buying it, you used to get, like, PC magazines that would come with discs and they'd have trials of games on. So you could play a little bit of them, see if you wanted to buy them. You don't really do that. What do we do now? We sign up for a beta. We do the testing for them. That's our trying it out, isn't it? Uh, so even that sort of changed. Uh, but although I, I can't say that I was there right for the start of home computing, I was there right for the start of the first home computers. And, and I've seen, you know, the console, Atari, con the basic console, I don't even know what it was called. Uh, Nintendo 64, Game Boy, portable console, Xbox and PlayStation, of course. I still think of those as quite recent um, because I was sort of adult when they came out for the first time. Um, and, but the first computer game, let me tell you about this. So the first computer game that I got, that we got on this first home computer, was on the screen were like blocks of various sizes. Those blocks represented tower blocks in a city. And you were a little chappy in a plane and you went wrong along the screen, from left to right at the top of the screen, along there. And you could drop bombs, but you couldn't drop at a massive rate. It was a recharge time. So you're gonna drop them every so often. And when you went across the screen, when you got to the other side of the screen, you'd go off it. You had no control over your plane. It would go off the other side of the screen and you'd come back on the other side of the screen, the left again, but a little bit lower down. You'd keep doing that and every time you'd get lower and lower. 
if you went into the side of one of these buildings, game over, you'd crashed. So the aim, you can see it coming, the aim was to drop bombs onto the tallest buildings first to try and get, and it wouldn't destroy the whole building, just a bit at a time. And you'd have to sort of get it to the point where you could land safely. So there were no buildings left when you got to the bottom bit. Now, let's forget about the morals at the moment of designing a game whereby the aim is to destroy an entire city just because you can't find an airfield. The graphics, I can't even begin to describe how primitive the graphics were. And the gameplay, of course, I mean, you can't imagine any less level of sophistication. I mean, it was one button. You didn't control where your plane went. You only controlled the use of the bombs and that, you know, so that was it. One button game. <laughs> uh, and we look now at, and I've, I've seen it over time, and the, the evolution of the graphics and the sophistication of games. And when you see that, you can't help but realise that whatever your thoughts about the future the further ahead you try and see, the more wrong you will be because there'll be other things that change in the world that will impact it. Another example could be telephones. Classic example. When I was young, when my first memories of telephones were like you can barely describe today. You know how like today, I haven't got my mobile phone with me at the moment, but if I have it, if I want to phone someone, you know, dial up. And it'll say dialing. And uh, sometimes it now says calling. But I've, I've still got a phone that says dialing. And I'm thinking, we don't dial anymore. Most people, you know, that are watching this probably don't even know what dialing is. They don't even realise it was a thing. So the telephone I remember, the first telephones that I remember, and these were, you know, had been around for a good long time as well. You, you, to call someone, you jammed a finger, it was a ring of numbers around the thing. You put your finger in this hole of the right number and you moved it around till a, a thing that stopped you and then took your finger out and it was a mechanical device. So it would then slowly go back and then you'd put your, when it had gone back, don't catch it out before it stopped, put your finger in the hole for the next number you wanted and do that, you know, and it, it could hurt your finger doing that too much. Um, and that's how you do rang someone. And, and when I say rang someone again, that was literal because the phone rang. It didn't make a sound, didn't play a tune. You know, it made, it was a mechanical bell in there. Um, it was a ring. And, and so I remember that. And then what came after that was a much smaller phone where you picked up the whole phone. It was connected by a cable to the base unit and you pressed buttons. To dial now so we, so we now stops dialing we still called it dialing um and and then that evolved into the portable handset so it wasn't you didn't now have to be connected by a cable the cable was still there that was in the base unit but now portable with an aerial you had to pull out like half a meter long aerial but it did mean you could wander around the room or even around the house all right if someone wanted to call someone you didn't have to shout upstairs for them to come down you could just take it to them. There's someone on the phone for you. There you go. Um, or wherever it happened to be. And then they got smaller. And then the aerials are now internal. You don't even see them anymore. I've got mine handy. I'm sure you all know what one looks like anyway. So light, small, no visible aerial. It's in there, but it's in there. Um, and then in terms of really going portable. So we have uh, mobile phones. Now mobile phones again have evolved. Huge big buggers they were to begin with. And as big as they were, that still wasn't big enough to house their power supply. So you had to carry around something the size of a, a briefcase, literally. It put it on you, it was the briefcase, you carried it around, big old thing. But it was mobile, it was mobile. And then they got smaller, they got small enough to be able to house their own power supply, smaller and smaller and smaller, until they could be quite small and you'd have to flip them open to call someone. Then you started to be able to access the internet on them at a very basic level, browsing web pages, not much more than that. And then we have smartphones now. And that's taken off and off and off. And we can do virtually everything on these phones now. You know, um, in theory, I don't have a, a facility for this, but some people do. You know, in theory, you know, on your mobile phone, you know, Amazon could deliver something. 
and you you can check with cameras in your house and go onto an app and go, oh yeah, you're the Amazon guy. I will open the door for you. Put it inside, please. Thank you much. Off they go. Right, I'll close the door now. All sorts of mad things you can do with these. It's barely used for ringing people at all these days. Um, but some people use them for that even. But it's used for so many more things in life. And then you think to yourself, because some people may think if they're still quite young, that all mobile phones are just going to get better and better. But when you've lived through all these changes, you realize, no, they're not. What's going to happen is it's going to get better up to a point, And then it's going to be completely replaced by something different. Because that's what happened with phones, it's what's happened with games, it's what happened with computers, it's what's happened with so many pieces of technology that we use in our everyday lives. It doesn't just get better, it gets better and then is replaced. And then the thing that replaces it gets better. And then that's replaced and it keeps going on like this. Um you know, mobile phones, for example. I mean, what we're looking at now, we're not going to have... Mobile phones are going to be archaic in 20 years' time. We're not going to have them at all because the functions that we require of them will be elsewhere. you are already designed bracelets you can wear. It will project the bloody screen onto your arm. Um, Google Glass, okay, it's not there yet, but that sort of thing. Contact lenses, I mean, beam the thing directly into your neurons, into your brain, is where we're going to be. Smart tattoos, maybe on the back of your hand. Um... You know, the idea of having to carry around a phone. Because that's a huge drawback. Wherever there's a drawback, people will try and eliminate that drawback. And I can see the drawback from my students, <laughs> the teacher, those who don't know. And my students there, half my students have phones where the screen's smashed to buggery. I don't know how they keep dropping it. I've never managed to drop or damage a mobile phone in my life. And, and I've had mobile phones longer than they've been alive. And yet they do on a regular basis. I had one of my students who... Uh, who got the new iPhone quite recently, he smashed it straight away. <laughs> Ow. So, you know, obviously the impetus is there to get rid of these cumbersome devices altogether. And, and it's bizarre that they can be thought of as cumbersome when I imagine what we had in the past, but they are. Um, so when you're looking at the future, you're, sort of, you're looking at it and you're thinking, well, this is what I intend to do. And where am I going to be in 10 years' time? Where am I going to be in 20 years' time? But when you've got to, to my time of life, then you think to yourself, but I can't possibly even imagine that because the world will change in ways that I can't even perceive of yet. So when you see the future, of course you see it in terms of your own plans. I think anyone who's got any drive about them, of course, has plans, there's things they want to do. But you also increasingly start to see the, the path ahead, not only in terms of your own plans, your own intentions, but also in terms of entropy and in terms of external factors out completely outside of your control that will affect things for good or for ill that's up in the air and then you know i imagine myself you know as an old man if i'm not already at the bus stop you know some teenager wanders too close to me fatal absolutely fatal so i'll start talking about them and i'll say to them oh do you know i remember the days when i could get on this bus and pay 2p you know, I'd get on and I'd pay the 2p to a conductor, not the driver, a conductor. And and they'd give you this little square yellow piece of paper. That was your ticket and you'd sit down and you'd get off. And uh, and you'd be there thinking, and, and here we are, you know, this would be 60 odd years later. And no conductor, the conductor's gone long ago. People, you know, younger, the younger members of you won't even remember conductors now. They've long gone. We still have drivers, though, but we won't, of course, in 20, 30 years' time, will we? We'll all be driverless. Probably won't even have money. There'll be no money to hand over. Um, we won't even be talking about contactless. It'll probably be biometrics. You'll probably just walk onto the bus. It'll note that you've walked onto the bus. And then you'll get off the bus. It's noted where you've got off the bus. And it will charge you accordingly without you having to do anything. And this teenager who wandered too close to me will be going, what are you on about, conductors, drivers? What are you talking about? 2p? What's 2p? There'll be no there'll be no need for any such thing as cash even, and therefore there won't be any need for currency. We'll probably have a global currency as such as it applies if we don't have the physical money. Who cares? I'm thinking, 2p? What are you talking about? 2p? 2p or not 2p? Are you muddling up the lines to Hamlet, you silly old duffer? You know, the world will have changed beyond all recognition. It already has. And I'm only theoretically halfway through my life. I think in reality I'm a bit more than halfway through, truth be told. Um, 
So that is basically going to sort of colour some of my thinking as I ramble my way through this series and in terms of trying to predict where I'm going to be in World of Warcraft in six months' time, years' time, two years' time, whatever. Um, but yeah, I will just finish off here uh, just as a, a by saying that the next episode I'm going to be talking about where I picked up my need for competitive hobbies, by the way. I mean, I always have a number of hobbies, but I always need one of them to be something that I can do seriously. And I think, you know, when I think about it, that came from somewhere. So I'm going to talk about that next week. And that's to do with my time when I was young in the Scouts and doing judo. Um, so I hope you found this entertaining at least. I, I'm going to aim, obviously I'll bring these out on Patreon as and when I do them, but I'll bring them out on YouTube. The aim will be for Friday so people can listen to it as a bit of, you know, start of the weekend nonsense uh, before you really get into it. It's a bit of relaxing time for you. Let me know what you think down below. Um, I'm not going to ask people to subscribe or like or anything like that because this is not a normal part of my channel. But I do hope you have a good weekend or good whatever time of the week you're watching it. Until next time, I'll see you later.